Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Welcome to the Power Hour. Once again, we get to uh, feast from the Word of the Lord, presented in, hopefully, ways that allow you to not only understand the Scriptures, but to see yourself in them. As I said, when I got back, I said to you that the more things change, the more they remain the same. And so here's what I want you to do for me. We do our best to get people to make the right kind of noise as we worship. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes when the people finish singing, I can see some people pass the want to clap hands, but something forces them to stop because they're like, oh, this is not holy. You can't clap hands in church. But I want you to do something for me. Don't clap hands, but turn to the person beside you and say to them, God loves you and so do I. Now, now, here, here's what I realized. Here's what I realized. Stop, stop. Here's what I realized. Your reluctance infects me before I speak. So call it ego, call it victimization, call it what you want, but here's what happens. I said something in a sermon three weeks ago, and when my brother was listening online, I, I, where he is now, he said to me, do people even respond when you're preaching? I said they do, but there are no microphones on top of them to catch the sound. So here's what I want you guys to do for my brother and everybody else. When I say turn to your neighbor and tell them God loves you and so do I, think about my brother and say it as loud as you can. God loves you and so do I. Go ahead, tell somebody. I, I feel that we are, we are quiet, not because it's a holy place. But for some reason, people feel uncomfortable. So I refuse to feel uncomfortable because you do. Try to relax. Amen, somebody. Outliers. Outliers. Uh, Pastor Henry already said this. I'm going to repeat it again, how this series came about. Uh, we, we talk a lot, right? And I promise you, half the time, we are not talking about you. We're just talking about the work in general. I've known Pastor for more than 12 years now. Right? I've known him for more than 12 years, and the reason we got close was because of the Lord's work, and that has persisted. So one day he's telling me about this strange biblical character I've never heard about. A lot of people testified that Joe, Joe Jehovah, that dude right there was uh, uh, in the scriptures. And so I've been thinking about this idea of outliers because I am a huge Malcolm Gladwell fan. Don't agree with all his ideologies, but I love his perspective as a journalist in attacking world issues and social issues in particular. I've read two books, that is, he's, four books. I want to mention two today, David and Goliath and Outliers. Now, obviously, I have little interest in the Elon Musks and the uh, 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 runners and, 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 and uh, Bill Gates and all these people that everybody tweets and Instagrams about. I'm interested in godly people in the context of the worship service. And so I've always had this idea that there are outliers in scripture and God wants each of us in here to be an outlier. And so we need time to expand what that means. Because again, there's a little bit of frustration on my part, just a little bit, not a lot. Because each of us are responsible for what we become. But here's my frustration. It's not a judgment because I live on the same street. People worship God, or at least they claim to. They're in the house of worship. They're singing. They have this label, and some of you have the courage to put it on your profiles on social media. I am a Christian. I love Jesus first, my wife, my kids, and everybody else. See, I see that on your profile. I appreciate what you're trying to do. But here's what God has called us to be. He has not called us to be weird. He has called us to be different. See, a lot of people think that to stick out, you got to do some weird stuff. But just being who you are in the context of the Lord, a lot of amazing things can happen for you. Let me get out of the rant and get into what the message is today. The series title with the subtitle is Outliers, Don't Be Regular. Don't Be Regular. Now, it's happening again. The message today is entitled, Pick Your Advantage. Pick 
your advantage. What has been accepted by many authors and reporters in our information age is that what sets apart certain people from others is their ability to pick the right advantage. That regardless of the background they come from, regardless of whether they are a minority, regardless of whether they come from an affluent, rich family, regardless of whether they have a natural intelligence that allows them to get all A's and not a single C or B, there are people who have stood out because they know how to pick their advantages. And if there's anybody in this world who ought to be able to be equipped to pick advantages, it is the people of God. Therein lies my frustration. That even though we claim to serve the Lord, we live on Blame Street alongside Victim Avenue, and sometimes we wander into Woe Is Me Alley. We live a life of blame. We live a life of passing the buck. The old generation blames the new generation. The new generation says the old generation knows nothing. Everybody is throwing the baby and the bathwater out. If you don't know what that means, just Google it and, and educate yourself. Bible text. I realized I'm already preaching and I haven't read a verse yet. Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, this series is close to my heart because the, the year is almost over. And there's this mediocrity that we're existing that is becoming exhausting for me. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. It's known as the Hall of Faith, where there are men and women who have stood out. In fact, Pastor, if, if, when we do season two in, in a couple of years, wherever uh, we might be online or whatever, we are going to focus on Hebrews 11 for Outliers season two. Because there's some remarkable men and women in this chapter worth mentioning. But for today, I am going to pick the most popular character in scripture. I said popular character, not being. Jesus is not a character. He's a being. The most popular character in scripture. Does anybody know? Anybody? Anybody know? It's okay to talk to me. Don't feel like you're breaking some kind of unwritten rule. Who is the most popular character in the Bible? That's right. I heard a kid shout Moses. He said what? My kid shouted Moses. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. M Moses. Moses. <laughs> Moses is mentioned more than 700 times in the Old Testament by name. He's referred to added on. In the New Testament, there's a reference to his name about 79 times. Moses, to me, is the ultimate outlier. Number one, Moses lived 120 years. The first 40 years of his life were spent in Egypt. The next 40 years of his life were spent in the backwoods of media. And then the last 40 years of his life were spent in the wilderness. And throughout that time, Moses experienced both advantages and disadvantages. But like the outlier that he was, he managed to navigate it all and become who he is. He is an outlier, spoiler ahead, to the point that God used him to encourage Jesus before his experience on the cross. It was Moses and Elijah who spoke to Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. What qualified Moses to be in that position? Because he was an outlier that chose his advantages. Bible text, Hebrews chapter 11. I'm reading from, uh, let's see where I can begin. I'm going to read from verse number 23. Hebrews 11, verse number 23. It was by faith that Moses' Moses's parents hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given them an unusual child. And they were not afraid to disobey the king's command. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures 
of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. Verse 27, icing on the cake. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. In case you thought that Moses ran away because he was afraid, he wasn't afraid. But he kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. The outlier's superpower is the ability to see the invisible. Let's pray one more time. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like Pastor H up here. Let's pray one more time. Lord, speak. We are listening. Amen. The message today is about Brother Moses. And, and ladies, I, I believe in, 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 in an equal playing field. Next Sabbath, I'm going to preach about a woman. I'm not going to tell you who she is, but she is amazing. Not Mary, not Esther, definitely not Lot's wife, and definitely not Job's wife either. We'll talk about, no, 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 Sister Jezebel, no, no. She is not amazing. She is something else. Okay. Two books by Malcolm Gladwell. In our series, inspired by the title but not the content, Outliers is about people who are different. Now, now David and Goliath is an interesting book. Uh, like I said, I don't agree with everything. I'm not up here preaching the gospel according to Malcolm Gladwell. But the ideology, the, the perspective rather, that he presents is what attracted me to the book. But in David and Goliath, he points out some things that are real. That a lot of people see Goliath as being big, therefore he has an advantage over David. But do you understand that physically somebody of that stature would be slower than somebody smaller? Not only was De uh, Goliath bigger, but he also had an armor on. Okay? And so for him to be able to fight with David, he had to take off his, his helmet to be able to deal with him. And in exposing his forehead, David saw an advantage. And that's why he knocked him in the forehead and then cut his head off with his own sword. That's a sermon for another day. What I'm extracting from the book is this idea that in life, we live through these four perspectives. Let's look at each of them slowly. Go back. Go back. Stay right there. In life, there are disadvantages that are advantages. I can give an example. Statistically, most wealthy people, most newly made millionaires and wealthy people don't come from wealthy families. They come from nothing. Do you know why? Because the kids or the generation that comes from wealth takes it for granted and two generations later lose it all. But the one who comes from nothing has a pound of flesh. They are determined to succeed, and so they succeed. So what is a disadvantage becomes an advantage. Number two, for some people, there are advantages that are disadvantages. I already gave you the example. Then there are disadvantages that are disadvantages. Doing the wrong thing at the wrong time with the wrong person never leads to the right thing. When a disadvantage becomes a disadvantage, usually we call that foolishness. Doing the wrong thing, like, like being poor and trying to steal and getting caught and going to jail. You're already poor, disadvantage. Thief, disadvantage. Go to jail, go to disadvantage. Marry the wrong person, go to jail, disadvantage. Advantages that are our advantages. This is where we all should be living on number four. We all should be seeking after advantages that are advantages. And I'm going to give it to you today. At the end of the sermon so you don't leave. Let's deal with the first one. Number one. Disadvantages that are disadvantages. Let's look at this from the lens of Moses' life. Moses' life, like any human being, does not begin with him, begins with his parents. I know, I am fully aware, as somebody who trolls the internet like everybody else, that we live in a generation that does not honor parents, does not honor authority. As long as you can comment, like or dislike it, you feel like an authority. But in scripture, great men and women had great mothers and fathers. Moses is no exception. The Bible says, let's go. 
Hebrews 11, 23, by faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months. Why did they need to hide him? Because sometimes leaders can be cowards. Sometimes leaders are driven by self-interest rather than the interest of their people. And so the Pharaoh that comes into the scene in the book of Exodus does not recognize the legacy of Joseph. And he decides that every single Hebrew is not worth it. And so every time a boy is born, the midwives, the ones who help the mothers give birth, are instructed, take those children and kill them. And so despite this mandate, this uh, state-inspired abortion, the mothers in, in, in Israel, in the small corner in Goshen, decide to still keep living their lives. And so Jochebed and, and his wife, or is Jochebed the mother? Moses' mother and father still decide to have a child. And it so happens it's a boy. And the Bible says for three months they hid him. I explored this already a few years ago, talking about the fact of what that was like socially. How do you hide a baby? Babies cry. Babies need food. Baby, babies need supplies. Your neighbors don't have to be your friend. They can snitch on you. And so for three months, they hid him. Why did they keep him? Because historically, some mothers didn't keep their children. Some got rid of the child. Some had the child taken from them. But why did they keep Moses? Was it because they just wanted to have a kid? No. It wasn't just about having a child. Having children doesn't make you an outlier. Having children doesn't make you an outlier. There's nothing special about you because you have kids. I get it. The, the single pastor without kids said, preach, pastor. But everybody else has kids. And like, Are you saying that kids are bad? No, I'm saying you're not special because you have kids. What makes you special is what you pour into your children. Look at what the Bible says. It says that they saw that God had given them an unusual child. Every parent thinks their child is special. Every parent. I think my kid is smarter than everybody else's kid. And I'll compete with you on that any day. Probably is not, but I'm his dad. That's what I think. Everybody's, every parent thinks their child will be the next president or rocket scientist. Until, of course, when you realize that uh, that's not what they're going to do. But they saw that God had given them an unusual child. And so they realized that what we are carrying is something greater than us. We are not afraid of the king. So we have to come up with a way to ensure that he lives. Look at the choice that they made. Uh, Pastor, help me out. Help me out. Two Bible texts on the screen. Verse Exodus 1, 22 and Exodus 2, verse 3. The first passage tells us that Pharaoh decided that every time a child was born, that it would either be strangled at birth or it must be taken and dumped into the river Nile. That's how Pharaoh operated to maintain his power. So every time a male child is born, when the midwives uh, receive that child out of the mother's womb, they would dump it into the Nile. Look at what Moses' parents did. The same Nile where children were being dumped into, they decided that rather than throwing him in, they were going to place him in. They put him in a basket strategically placed him at a, a certain point for a certain reason, I'll point out. And then Miriam, his sister, his older sister, hid behind some bushes and waited. Because during devotion the previous night or the previous week, the mother, because let's be honest, most of the time, mothers think of better ideas for the kids than the fathers do. I am not proud to say that. No, no, I'm proud enough I'm humble enough to say that. I'm, I'm a real man inside. It was hard. She said, my imagination, honey, this boy needs to live. He needs to live. But in order for him to live, he needs to leave. He cannot live if he stays here. He's got to get out. Where is the best place for us to put him? Well, when you are a person of faith, if Pharaoh is killing people, why not get him to raise your child? And so they knew 
that the princess would come to the Nile at a certain point, whether to take a bath or to worship, because the Nile was a god to them. Whatever it was, they knew the time and place she came. But beyond that, Pastor H, I believe that they knew something about her beyond her habits. She had proven to be a sympathizer with the Hebrew people. Because Moses was more than eight days old. And so she would have known that this is a Hebrew child. How? Circumcision. She could have known that, okay, this is not an Egyptian baby. He doesn't have the, the little cute hair thingy at the back. And, he, and, and his, and his, and his pinto has been cut a little bit. And so she takes him. And she takes him into the Egyptian palace. That was a disadvantage for Moses' family because they lost a son. But it was an advantage because now he got to live. Let's talk about the Nile. Go ahead. Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead. Sometimes God will deposit you where the devil wants to drown you. There are some of you in situations right now, it feels like the Nile. In fact, it's almost the river denial. You are constantly in pain. You are constantly complaining. Everything is woe is me. Your life is unfair. Home sucks. Your job sucks. Your health sucks. The church sucks. The moment you go on social media, you compare yourself to other people, you feel like you're drowning. But I'm here to tell you that the place of drowning can be a place of growth in the hands of God. Only the outlier understands that. Everybody else is so used to living in the space of their fear and their suffering and their pain and their misery and failure. But the person driven by faith understands, this is not where I want to be. But one day God will get me out of it and I'll be the person I'm supposed to be. Until you get to that place, you are going to keep sitting in here or wherever it is that you call home. And you're going to keep wondering, why am I drowning? And God is saying, you, you don't have to drown. Just, just get in the basket with me, and I'll get you where you need to get to. Amen, somebody. Amen. Let's go. I wanted to give an example, a real example of somebody who understood. Let's test it out and see if it works. Yeah, I'm pressing both. Oh, not this one. This one. Praise the Lord. I have an advantage now. Viktor Frankl is an Austrian psychotherapist and psychologist. He had a profession. He was educated. Well-doing man. World War II hits. Hitler decides, if you don't have blue eyes, white skin, blonde hair, you don't deserve to live. So he rounded up all the Jews, all the Jehovah's Witnesses, anybody that opposed him, and he dumped them into concentration camps. Viktor Frankl's family all died in the concentration camp. Wife, kids, relatives, all gone. Most people died before they died. They lost their will to live because they were being treated like animals in those concentration camps. But Viktor Frankl, being who he was, took the situation he was in and decided, what can I learn from this? And so, surviving it, praise the Lord, he did a, a, an evaluation of the fact of what made some people make it and others not. Because some people actually committed suicide in those camps before they could be gassed or killed or shot on the firing squad. And he discovered, read his book, amazing book. A man who was in Nazi Germany concentration camps wrote a book entitled Man's Search for Meaning. What made him survive is that in the midst of all that uncertainty and absolute disaster, he found an advantage. What does my life mean? What is life going to be after this? The outlier superpower is the ability to look at what is now and see what comes next and keep on moving. Same thing with cancer survivors. Most people with terminal diseases, the majority that make it, it's not just because of the treatment that the doctors are giving them, but it's a will to live and do something after. That's what I'm talking about today. This 
quiet quitting that we're doing. Pastor, we, we just shot a podcast episode talking about quiet quitting. People are quietly dying before dying. They're giving up at work, giving up in their relationships, giving up on their health, giving up on their spirituality. We're up in here. Oh, yeah, we're sitting in church. We're checking the box. I went to church on Saturday. Let's see what God does for my business. Let's see what God does for my kids. Let's see what God does for the frivolous, mediocre existence that we have. Sometimes your origin story can be disadvantageous. Giving it time can prove otherwise. Now, let's be honest. Most lessons are learned in hindsight. We, re we recognize God's hand when it has already happened. While it's happening, it's difficult. But I am living proof with the minor struggle that I'm facing as an individual right now that you can turn your curse into a blessing. You don't understand what I mean. Let me break it down. I never thought I'd get to talk about this, but I'm going to do it right now because what's the, what's the pain in doing it? Three years ago, in fact, three years ago, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease that is changing the way I look. Two years from now, I am not going to look the way I look right now. And so I stopped stepping on the stage to speak. Because the psychological toll it was taking on me was more than I could handle while dealing with criticism and judgment from other people. So in my downtime, I decided I still want to preach because God has laid that thing on my heart. I started doing some work with a friend in South Africa. Pastor, you've been a part of that? Speaking to the students on campus. And my friend said to me when he asked me to do it, I said to him, dude, I, I, I cannot. I, I can't stand in front of a camera. I'm not looking like I used to. And each day, each month, I'm changing, I'm evolving. And he said something to me that I'll never, ever forget. He said to me, whatever you're going through now, there's a young person who's going through probably the same thing or equivalent, some image issue, some actual issue. He's dealing with students who are dealing with abuse, young girls who've been raped and is pregnant. The church is judging her because she's pregnant but doesn't know how it's happened. Tell your story to them. And I'm here to tell somebody that what seems like a disadvantage to somebody else, I am okay with it. This is me. I'm okay with it. And I want you to be okay with you. Amen, somebody. Amen. Don't let disadvantages stop you because God can use it for good. Amen again. Amen. Let's talk about advantages that are disadvantages in the context of Moses. The Bible says in verse number 10 that later on, because God's providence worked it out, that when they handed Moses over to Pharaoh's daughter, Miriam stood by. And so the Pharaoh's daughter thought, I, I need somebody to take care of this kid. The, the, the Hebrew people were known as the nannies and the maids for the Egyptians. And so Miriam's daughter offered, I can find somebody for you. And so Miriam called her mother and she became her son's nanny. And she got paid to be her son's nanny. She got paid to be her son's nanny. She gave him over and God gave him back with a little bit of cheddar on the side. And for almost 12 years, Moses was raised by his mother. But when he became a young boy, the Bible says Pharaoh's daughter took him and Moses grew up behind the walls of the palace. So for 12 years, the time that his mother had... She told him who he was. She told him who he was. They didn't have much. They were slaves. They worked for no pay but just to survive. But she told him who he was, pastor. Pharaoh's daughter changed his name. Do you know why his name is Moses? He didn't get that from his mama. He got that from his stepmama. Ever, ever, ever read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad? This is Rich Mom, Poor Mom. Right? Rich mom, poor mom. Poor mom had him for 12 years. Rich mom had him for about uh, 40 minus 12. Yeah, m math is not our thing. Let me ask the people that know math. What is that? 28. Almost 28 years, Moses grows up in Egypt. Being Pharaoh's daughter. Now for the Babylonians and the Egyptians, when they gave you a name, it, it, it wasn't without consequence. The, the reason he got the name Moses is because she drew him out of the Nile. Drawn out. That's what the name means. Right? She named him the thing she found him in. She named him the thing she found him in. See, we do that every day with people. 
We refer to them as that person. Hey, what's that sister's name? The, the one that cheated on her husband. What's her name? Right? That's what we do. We identify people by the sin, not by who they are now. So I'm here to tell somebody, listen, the outlier knows people can call you what they want. But as long as God got your heart, that's all that matters. She's not Rahab the harlot. She's Rahab. He's not doubting Thomas. He's just Thomas. Stop giving people a name just because of their past. You don't know what God has brought them through. You are not what you went through. You are what got you through. I find, uh, and I love JCC, to, to this day, I still call this church the city of refuge. Oh, there's a lot of convicts up in here. There are people who are running from something because they know they can disappear in the sea that is this church. And I love that pastor. I know people say, oh, you're, you're not friendly. You're wearing Gucci and all those branded stuff. But you don't know. People are carrying some crazy stuff inside. So if you're here for the first time, you are in the right place. You are not what you went through. You are what got you through. God got you through. People's comments, people's rejection, people's assumptions about you mean absolutely nothing. What matters is, where is God taking you now? Yes, Pharaoh's daughter brought him out. Yes, some person gave you the job. Yes, somebody paid for your way to, to make it in school. Yes, somebody was there when you needed them. But the bottom line is, God did it through them because God blesses people through people. Amen, somebody. Hebrews eleven twenty four. 24, it was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called Pharaoh's daughter. I, I don't think we fully appreciate when we read the text the advantages, quote unquote, that Moses had. Do you understand that be, by being raised as Pharaoh's daughter, that potentially made him the prince of Egypt? Do you remember the power that Joseph had? The access that Joseph had? The power that he had? Moses had the opportunity to be Joseph. From the time he was born, he was given a silver spoon he did not deserve. She raised him as her own, in her home. But Moses had his mother's words in his head. And I love his mother because she was smart enough to understand. I've, I've heard preachers preach on the text and they make Pharaoh's daughter look like a bad person and Moses' mother look like a good person. I'm here to change the narrative, and I want you to follow my logic. I got this quote off a website on, on relationships, and I believe it was a young lady who was expressing the struggles that she's having in life. And I like the statement because it fits in with the point I want to make. Listen to this. I feel like I'm stuck between two worlds, wanting to be a part of the new one, but feeling at home in the old. Now I'm not a part of either, and I'm alone and lonely, stuck in nothing. Let me break it down. See, you read the text because you're in a hurry to go to work or go to school or go to bed. You read the text because the preacher said so, but you never take time to really stop and think, what was it like for Moses? You were born a slave, but raised a prince. You're in the palace, eating caviar, eating all the exotic food exported or imported around the world, but your mom, your dad, and your siblings are in the gutter, not even eating butter. Going through the worst experiences, but you're in the palace. You've enrolled in the private schools. In fact, I believe that now and again, Moses would be singing the, the Hebrew songs. He'd be singing the old hymns in the palace, and his, and his, and his stepmom would ask him, what is that song that you're singing? And he'd have to explain what it was. And she'd say to him, don't worry about those old songs. I'm going to send you to the, the best musicians and the best uh, 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 music teachers in town. And they'll teach you how to sing our songs. He would try to read the Hebrew scriptures and talk about the old stories about Abraham and Jacob and Isaac. The stuff his mother has said. But now his, his rich mom is trying to indoctrinate him in the ways of Egypt. That can create identity issues in a child. And I believe, with all my heart, that's where your kids are today. Obviously, they can't talk about it because you're old school. You come from the do as I say, not as I do generation. You come from the it's tradition and nothing else. It's culture and nothing else. So your kids are stuck making private decisions and not telling you. That's where Moses was. 
And the Bible says for 40 years, he was stuck until he turned 40. That's when he decided, this is not for me. Now, somebody's thinking, wow, 40, that's, that's old. No, it's not. He died at 120. So that means a 40-year-old then is a 25-year-old now. So anybody between the age of 20 or 21 and 25, you're Moses. This is the time to make some life-changing decisions. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired of being sick and tired of hearing a 30-year-old tell me that mom and dad told me this is what I should do. Oh, no, I'm not expecting an amen on that one. I am going to keep pushing at this until somebody hears me. If you are not raising your children to make life-altering decisions, as a parent, you're failing or struggling. And I understand. It wasn't even easy for Moses' mother. Because later on, he makes a decision that wasn't the right one. It happens. Let's talk about disadvantages that are disadvantages. The Bible says in verses 11 to 12 that one day, Moses is at breaking point. He's had enough. He's been watching his people suffer. He's been up in the palace getting trained, military strategy, man-to-man um, uh, -man combat. He knows their guards. He knows their history. He knows their geography. He knows the economy. Moses is getting ready to be the king, the pharaoh of Egypt. If he became pharaoh, one day he'd be, he'd be buried with his wives. Wives, plural. His wealth and all the stuff that he had. That was the privilege of pharaoh. You had political and religious power. He was both a man and a god at the same time. One day Moses is walking in the slums or in the fields. He sees an Egyptian, a nobody, beating one of his own people. And in a rage, Moses kills him and buries his body. He thinks that nobody saw him, but somebody saw him. The sermon is about to take a left turn. Stay with me. Moses assumed, and this is in the book of Acts. Stephen is preaching. And Stephen is telling the people in the room that Moses thought his own people would support him. Yeah, he thought, I killed an Egyptian, therefore my people would realize, I'm a revolutionary, I've got the access, I've got the power, let's do this. Moses assumed his fellow, his fellow Israelites would realize that God had sent him to rescue them, but the Bible says they did not. The very next day, Moses goes back to be with his people. But I think I know what Moses' problem was. He was dressed in bling bling, literally. The Egyptian royalty wore gold. And he went to visit his people dressed like an Egyptian. And when his people saw him, they did not welcome him the way he thought they would. Sort of like you, my brothers and sisters in Indonesia. When you go overseas and you come back, you think that your neighbors are going to be happy you're back. But no, they're judging you. Because now you've picked up American slang. You're dressing like the Americans. You're driving an expensive car. They're hating on you. So Moses He's talking to his people, and the person says, oh, so you want to come kill me like you did the Egyptian? That rattled Moses. It made him panic just a little bit. If my own people are not going to support me, if the Egyptians I don't want to be a part of, what am I a part of right now? What am I? Listen to the statement. Just because you hate the same thing, it doesn't make you allies. I've been a Christian for 20 years, and this statement holds true today more than it did before. Just because we claim to believe the same stuff doesn't mean that we like each other. Just because we're sitting here singing the same songs doesn't mean we're on the same page. You know how I know? When the service is over, you don't even know where the person you're sitting next to lives or where they're going. You don't even know whether they can afford to have lunch this afternoon or not. All you're thinking about is, service is over, let me go take a nap, and just go about my business. Not where I wanted to go with this, but let me keep going. I want to share a story. It's a bit of a crude story. Parents, please don't translate this to your kids. Right? I can't get into trouble because I'm not the pastor of the church. I read the story. The story is a lesson about a, a sparrow that during a season, birds fly in a certain direction. So to avoid the winter, they will fly south. But this sparrow decided... I'm a boss. I don't have to do what everybody else is doing. I'm going to do my own thing. So he stuck around. But unfortunately, when the winter season came, his wings froze. And he dropped down into the, on the ground on a farm. And as he's lying there with his wings frozen, death is knocking. The story says that a cow came and crapped on him. 
So this huge pile of manure on top of the bird. Now you think that the manure is bad, but actually the cow's manure is warm. How do I know? I was a child before and I stuck my hands inside. It's warm. And so because of the warmth of the crap, the bird's wings thawed out and so he lived. But remember, he's still stuck under the crap. A cat comes and the cat hears this little bird singing and so the cat moves away the crap and eats the bird. Moral of the story, not everybody that craps on you is your enemy. Amen, somebody. Not everybody that gets you out of the worst situations in life is your friend. Nobody likes that story. The enemy of your enemy is not always your friend. Moses learned that the hard way. He doesn't want to be identified as an Egyptian. His own people don't recognize him. And so what is the next thing to do? The Bible says he leaves. Egypt and Goshen. Not the sermon for today. Being an outlier places you outside the us versus them box. I believe that if you are to succeed in this life, and I'm not talking about business, career, being the greatest or whatever. Not, not, not my focus. If you want to succeed at being an ambassador of heaven in a way that allows people who are outside the church to admire you, and people inside the church should respect you. Because that's the ultimate goal. Jesus succeeded at one of those things. More people outside loved and appreciated him than inside the church. Probably one of the most tragic narratives in scripture. People always assume that if Jesus came to this, I ask somebody, if Jesus came, what church would he go to? And everybody thinks their denomination is the one Jesus would go to. I, am, I want to disappoint everybody and say, I have a feeling he ain't going to nobody's church. He'll come, but he'll stand outside and preach to the people coming in. Because that's what he did in the New Testament. Why did he do that? Because he did not want to be put in the us versus them box. The outlier understands that. So Moses said, I am neither my, my mother's son or Pharaoh's daughter's son, but I am a child of God. He identified himself with his people. Not just his family. What, what does that mean? Do you understand that if Moses stayed in the palace, he could have helped his family out financially? He could have taken care of them. He could have sold his soul and provided for them. But he rejected the power of a pharaoh. He rejected the advantages because he understood who he was. Finally, the advantages that are advantages. In Luke chapter 16 verse... Eight, Jesus is in the process of concluding a parable. Let me, let me rush on. I know I've, I've gone on and on longer than I want to. Jesus tells a parable about a man who gets fired and is given notice. And in the process of give, being given notice, he is told, balance the books before you leave. And so what the man does is he looks at all the creditors. He looks at all the people that owe the business or the man, the owner of the business. And he calls them and he says to them, how much do you owe? Oh, I, I owe 100 million. That's okay. Just pay five, uh, 50 million. Call another person. How much do you owe? I owe a billion. It's okay. Just pay 500 million. The owner comes back. He looks at the books. He turns to the man and says, you're smart. You're smart. So Jesus takes a negative story to make a powerful and positive illustration. And the point that Jesus was making is up on the screen. Feel ashamed as I read. It is true. That the children of this world are more shrewd, smarter, more street smart in dealing with life, in dealing with the world around them, than are the children of the light. Do you know what Jesus is saying, Pastor? I know you know. Do you know what Jesus is saying? He's saying that the worldly people, in the context of their life, how they've been raised, the jobs they do, the businesses they have, what they believe. They are more able to function in the context of that than God's own people are. God's people are str struggling with identity crisis. I, if I work for somebody that doesn't believe in Jesus, does that mean that I'm doing the wrong thing? If my boss is a Muslim, can I represent God? And so you wrestle with this all your life. Meanwhile, the person in the world has not stressed about it. He relates with everybody. He does business with anyone, but he keeps being who he is. It's only the people of God that can't be true to who they are in the context of the world. In church, we are Adventists. 
We're Catholic. We're Pentecostal. We're everything in here. But the moment we leave, we become uncertain about it. And so we take the light and we hide it. But God didn't want that for Moses. And so if it meant taking him away from home, taking him away from the palace, and for 40 years, Moses was a shepherd boy. Not only was he a shepherd boy pastor, he became an employee for his father-in-law. I would never advise anybody to work for their father-in-law. <laughs> never. From being the prince of Egypt to working for your father-in-law, that was a downgrade socially. But when it came down to it, Moses learned humility in that experience. But don't you dare think that Moses' leadership only came from taking care of sheep because that's not how the world works. Everything that he learned in Pharaoh's house, he used it to lead 600,000 people out of Egypt. Because God will take a disadvantage, turn it upside his head, and use it for good. There are things you learned before you became a believer. Guess what? God is going to use it for his good. All the wealth and all the resources, all the, the contacts, God can use them. Amen, somebody. Stop having this identity crisis of, oh, if people know that I know this person, or if people know who, who my boss is, or be you for God. Daniel worked in Babylon. Joseph worked in Egypt. Esther was the wife of a pagan man. I really pray I'm getting through, man. Moses was taught all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was powerful in both speech and action. He didn't learn it from his poor mother. He learned it from his rich mother. So whether they're heathen or not, okay, stop this us and them nonsense. You're, you're up in here, but the person paying your bills is not an Adventist. The person who's making it possible for you to drive a car is not a Christian. Stop looking at it as us and them. Look at the fact that God has called you to be an example to them and to everybody else. That is why people to this day keep questioning, why do I dress the way I do when I preach? Because I am not what I'm wearing. I am what I'm saying. Uh, I'll leave it alone. I'm starting to sound angry now. Uh, true wisdom. True wisdom is seeking out advantage that fits the season of your life. Those young people in the room right now, if you come from a family that can afford to take you to the most expensive schools, don't be apologetic about it. Just make sure you use that privilege that you have. For those who don't have that privilege, like me, spend time in the library longer than everybody else. Pastor, you know what it's about, man. We couldn't afford to be in the Philippines. It was a hustle. But that meant our GPA had to be higher than everybody else. It meant we had to do more than everybody else. This brother standing in front of you right now was in the Philippines for four years. I didn't study for about a year and a half, but I finished a program in less than three years. You know why? Because I had a disadvantage. And so to overcome it, I had to do more than everybody else. Stop being a victim. Start being a victor in Jesus' name. Amen, somebody. Amen. Hebrews 11, 25 and 26, the Bible says two things. I want you to focus on two things. Moses chose. He made a choice. Moses thought. He contemplated these things while eating caviar, while sleeping in Egyptian cotton sheets with 4,000 thread count, while having a servant to be a human air conditioning unit, being carried all over the Nile and going to places because he could, sitting with the greatest and most influential people Moses was processing. Is this who I am? Is this what I'm supposed to be doing? And he made the decision. I'm old enough. I am wise enough to decide my future. And the Bible says he let go, number one, of the pleasures of sin. Number two, the treasures of Egypt. This is hard in a hustle culture, pastor. It's hard to preach to young people and tell them money is not as important as your spirituality. It ain't easy. But it's easy to say that to an old man who's been working all his life and now he's spending all his money trying to buy his health back. So I'm, t I'm saying to a young person right now, go ahead, do the job, build the business, pursue that entrepreneurial path that you're on. But Solomon says, don't forget your creator in the days of your youth because one day, one day is coming where you have to choose between money and God, what will you do? He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasure of 
of Egypt. See, this is the question I want to throw in your mind and I'll stop. I, I have more, but I want to stop right here. What determines whether you're an outlier is the answer to the question up on the screen. Because the reality is we all consider reward. I don't care who you are. Spiritual, we all consider what can I get out of this? When you sit in a job interview, when you sit on a date, when you sit in a, in, in a place trying to consider where to live, you ask yourself, what do I get out of this? Why not do the same thing when it comes to spiritual matters? Here's the question. Are you wrestling more with what you must give up or are you wrapping your mind around what is to gain? Every time, pastor, we sit with people in a Bible study, it's going good, man. You're, you're convincing them of the truth and the logic is just sticky, man. man. This makes sense. And at the end of the sessions, you say to them, it's time to commit to Jesus. Ah, pastor, the thing is my job requires me to work on Saturday mornings and blah, blah, blah. My family doesn't belong. So, so all the stuff that we've said, you, you agree to it. When it comes down to commitment, it's difficult. And most people struggle. I'm sorry, we all struggle. Commitment is not always easy when things are on the line. I'm up here preaching as if I got it figured out. If somebody puts a gun to my son's head and said, will you deny Jesus? I don't know what answer I will give. I don't know. But right now, all I know is day by day, do the little bit that I can. And I'm encouraging you, learn to answer this question the right way. And you might become an outlier. Amen, somebody. I'm done. I'll stop right there. I promise there's more slides, but I, I think the point has been received. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible. It is impossible. It's what? It's what? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Notice, it doesn't talk about money. It doesn't talk about influence or power, speaking ability, singing ability, the ability to move people. No, no. What moves God is faith. And then he continues to say, it is impossible to please God without faith because they who believe that he is the seeker and the rewarder of them that diligently seek after him. Some version of that. When you diligently seek the Lord, the Bible says he will reward you. It's not my job to stand up here and say, he'll make you rich. He'll give you a bunch of smart kids and he'll give you a pretty or, 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 or handsome husband. It's not my place to do that. But it's my place to say that if you diligently seek the Lord like Moses did, verse 27 says, he was chasing after the invisible one. The person of faith, aka the outlier, has this ability to chase after things they cannot see. So they do the work, young people. They study. They study. They study. They save up the allowance that they receive from their parents, pastor. They save it up. While everybody else is spending, they're saving. Hey, well, hey what's up, man? How come we're we only going to uh, uh, Burger King? I'm sorry, to Burgreens. To Burgreens. Vegetarian, right? How come you're going there, but you're not eating in expensive places? How come he, he intimidates me with diet, so I have to keep qualifying? Vegetarian burgers, right? Uh, how come you're not spending as much as we do? No, it's cool, man. I'm okay with that. Until one day, one day, Brother Nick, huh? you bought that one Bitcoin when it was $50. Now Bitcoin is worth $1 million. You struggle for a long time while everybody else was watching you. And the invisible becomes real. Does anybody know where Moses is right now? Where's Moses? He's in heaven. He believed in, in, in the invisible so much that God resurrected him and said, dude, come home. Come home. See, we're trying to get where Moses is. And how we do that is not by being spiritual and inaccessible. No, it's the everyday life. I don't care whether you're in Pharaoh's, in Pharaoh's house. I don't care whether you're in Babylon. Whatever you're doing or the job you got, that's fine. Don't feel uncomfortable. What you should feel uncomfortable is getting stuck on the pleasures of sin and being driven by money and wealth. Those things are neutral. Money is neither evil or good. It's just a thing. How are you going to lose your wealth over money? How are you going to lose your, your, your family over money? How are you going to lose your reputation and the things that matter the most just to have access to buy expensive things? It's not enough. Moses didn't become Pharaoh, but guess what? He led a larger crowd than Egypt. He watched Egyptian army, the entire Egyptian army get swallowed up in the Red Sea. Hi. 
This is close to me. This is close to me. I'm, I'm talking to young people right now. I, I think it's the, it's the hardest part of ministry right now for me. Preaching is not easy because we're good at it, but it's easy because we speak and then we bounce. But when you sit down and talk to a young person that you think is coming from privilege, but they're struggling. They're struggling with identity. That's, that's real. That's real. Pastor, they, they've, they've adopted this ideology. Who, who's God? My generation had to hide to disobey God. This generation is not hiding the fact that they don't believe in God. They're open about that. Pastor, no example at home. I don't see the example at home. So why should I follow this thing? I'm here because my family said so. So, so, so for those who are doubts, forgive me sometimes if you hear me speaking as if I'm preaching to young people. But they're the ones I'm having conversations with in the week. So I'm saying to those young people, Moses was young once upon a time. I know that Hollywood has shown you this picture of, a, of an old man with a stick and a beard, but he was young once upon a time. He tasted poverty and prosperity, but he made a choice. And by the way, he didn't become poor. He became a leader. Heads bowed, eyes closed. This is, this is not just a sermon. This is not me meeting a quota because I have to preach today. This is... This is really me speaking to somebody. Aren't you tired? I did. It took a lot of pain and suffering for God to throw at me for me to realize that I wasn't all that. All the disadvantages I picked, all the bad choices I made led me to the place I'm at right now. But at the same time, all the advantages in God that I chose have given me a beautiful, patient woman that's my wife and a beautiful son. And I'm saying to somebody else in the room right now, stop looking at other people. Keep your head down. Stay on your lane. And trust that whatever state you're in right now, you may not have what other people have. No, scratch that. You may not have the things that people say you should have. Who says you need to get married? Who says you need to have kids? Who says you need to become a doctor? Who says you need to do what other people say? Heavenly Father, it is a, it's a burden I carry because I've, I've adopted myself to have meals, like Jesus said, with the publicans and the sinners because I am a public and I am a sinner. So as I break bread with people who are not Adventist, who are not Christian, people who are outsiders, I, I recognize in them everything I see in the church. The only difference is they are honest about themselves. They are honest about their struggles. Lord, they talk about having issues with masturbation and pornography. They talk about having issues with cheating on their partner. They talk about having issues with not loving their job, being stuck and just, just existing every single day. But Lord, I thank you. I'm humble enough to stand before my own people and I'm saying to them right now, it's, it's time. It's, it's time to stop thinking in terms of us versus them. It's time to start thinking like Moses. The Bible says that Moses looked to Christ. He looked to the invisible one and the, the invisible one directed the path of his life. He became a game changer. He became an influencer. He became a leader. He became the Moses we know today. All because he picked his advantages. There's somebody in here that needs to pick Jesus, the greatest of all advantages. There's somebody that needs to say, I'm tired of running. I'm tired of hiding. I'm tired of being behind these excuses and this old baggage that I can't get rid of. I've played the blame game long enough. It's, it's time for me to come home. It's time for me to surrender my life to Jesus. I've made bad choices and I've picked disadvantages, but it's time. It's time to pick Jesus. I mean, I'm praying for them. Make them uncomfortable. Make them feel as if they cannot go to bed until they choose Christ. Because that's what matters. I pray, Father, that you will help us to change our perspective. None of us is righteous. We're all broken. We're all wounded. We're all trying to figure out how to get out of Egypt. It doesn't matter whether we're in the palace or in the slums of Goshen. We're all in Egypt. But we need to get out. We need to get out. It's scary in the wilderness. It's lonely. There's nobody to give us a like or a comment. There's nobody to give us appreciation and affirmation. But sometimes it takes the wilderness to get us to the promised land. Somebody right now needs to get out of Egypt. I'm praying for them, Lord. 
Help them overcome their addiction. Help them overcome their weakness. Help them overcome the thing that's pulling them down. The people who are pulling them down. We are not here to judge you. We are here to lift you up. I want to be like the basket in the Nile. I don't want you to throw you in because I want you to drown. I want you to float. I want you to prosper. I want you to succeed. Father, with my hands raised, I pray. Be above your people today. Watch over them. Be beneath your people today. Lift them up. Walk by, your side, walk by their side today. Be their friend. Walk in front of them. Be their guide. Walk behind them. Be their encourager. Walk around them. Be their protector. But above all, be in their hearts so that they can be like Jesus. The greatest advantage ever. In his name we pray. Let everybody say amen. And amen. So I believe that that word did something in your heart and it spoke to you. And I just want to encourage you that you respond to it. Do not delay. God loves you more than he loves life itself. And Jesus died to prove it. And we as a ministry at Facts Alive believe that this is our mission. We want to help you to know Jesus better and to know him more clearly and to love him more dearly. The number is on the screen. Kindly text us, kindly write to us or call us and we'll be more than happy to help you. Perhaps you need prayer, you need encouragement, you need counseling. Please also reach out. We are available for you to help you. And if the Lord has inspired you to give and to partner with us in ministry, the number is also on the screen and you can simply give whatever the Lord has put on your heart to work and partner with us. May God bless you and take care. I will see you very soon.